Hey, how you doing? This is Craig Beck from StopDrinkingExpert.com. Today's video blog is a response to James. James Herbert has sent me a message. And I think he's looking for a, a bit of clarity on a couple of things I said in the book, Alcohol Lied to Me. Uh, so I'll break his question down into two parts. Uh, the first thing is, um, it's about moderation. Is, are there people that can just happily drink in moderation for the rest of their lives? And if alcohol is so dangerously addictive, how come everyone doesn't get addicted? And he says that in, in the book that I say that everyone who drinks has a problem. And I, so I think he's looking for some clarity on that. Let me explain. When I say that everyone, has, everyone who drinks alcohol has a problem, I don't mean that everyone is going to see their life crash to the ground and be hopelessly addicted and get DUIs and, you know, all that. that I don't mean that. What I mean is alcohol is a problem in itself. It's not what it claims to be. It claims to be a solution to life's problems. It claims to help us get to sleep, help us relax, give us confidence, and all these other things that it can't do. The marketing suggests that it's a harmless social pleasantry. It is none of the things that it claims to be. Alcohol is attractively packaged poison in a pretty bottle. That's all it is. And so alcohol is a bit like quicksand. And what I mean is if you have alcohol in your life, you're exposed to risk. You're exposed to something that could become a problem in the same way that if you walk into an area that has a quicksand pit, you're in danger just by the very nature that you are near something that could kill you. And that's what I mean by everyone who has alcohol in their life has a problem. Because, you know, when you walk into the middle of a quicksand pit and you start sinking, that is not the point that risk began. That is not the point where you are in danger. You are in danger the moment you step into the area where there is quicksand. And in the comparison to alcohol, when you realize that you can no longer control your drinking and you can't stop any time you like, like you've been saying for years, that's not the point that you get into danger. That's not the point where the risk begins. The risk begins the moment you take your first drink. That's what I mean. So, as James says, you know, if alcohol is this highly addictive substance, and we know it is, alcohol is the second most addictive substance on planet Earth, just behind heroin. So forget what the marketing says. This is a devious poison that knows exactly what it's doing, and it kills three million people every year. But if it's so addictive, how come some people don't get addicted? That seems weird, doesn't it? And the answer, James, is... Look, not everyone who take, consumes something that is addictive gets addicted because most of these things are learned addictions. You have to ignore some pretty alarming warning signs to get past the sticking point and get to the point of addiction. I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, I had a judo injury and I damaged my left hip quite badly and it needed an operation to repair the damage. There was a, a rip in the labrum around the top of my joint. So I had to have an operation and it was very, very painful. And the doctor prescribed me tramadol, which is an opioid painkiller, very addictive. Uh, at the same time, coincidentally, a friend of mine also had a problem with his hip and he was also given tramadol. Now, we were both on this opiate painkiller for around four or five months, I believe. The outcome of that was he got addicted to it and he had a horrible time getting off it. He had severe withdrawal. He had to taper him off it, himself off it very, very slowly. Whereas I, the former problem drinker, had no problem with it. Just stopped taking it, just removed it from my life and was not a problem. So how can one substance that we know is addictive affect two people differently? Well, th that's, that's true of all these things. They affect people differently based on how they're used, how often they're used, the, the subconscious anchoring that we have to those elements. You see, we've been using alcohol for years and decades, and we've psychologically anchored alcohol to many things in our life. We've linked alcohol with fun, alcohol with sleep, alcohol with confidence, alcohol with relaxation. And it's a bit like Pavlovian conditioning after a while. You know Ivan Pavlov, where he, he did that experiment where he fed his dogs and rang a bell, and eventually he wouldn't even have to feed them. He could ring the bell and get the same response. They would salivate and expect food. 
So we've got this going on in our head, but to get there takes effort, takes passion and commitment. And us drinkers, we're very passionate about our drinks, aren't we? Don't we just focus our whole day on when we can drink next? And you need to put that effort in to get addicted. If only we'd taken all that passion and commitment and put it on something more worthwhile. Imagine how our lives would be. But alcohol is a learned addiction because there are some very clear and obvious warning signs that what we're doing is wrong, dangerous, and liable to kill us. And to get addicted, you have to repeatedly ignore those warning signs. The first one you get is when you first take a sip of your dad's whiskey. And it tastes disgusting. I remember it like it was yesterday. I sneaked a glass of my dad's whiskey and I spat it all over the dining room, all over my mum's new table and carpet. And I got sent to bed. And I, I lay in my bed as this like 11 year old boy. And I was thinking, I don't understand. How would anyone voluntarily put that stuff in their mouth? It's like gasoline. It's, oh, it's horrible. So here's the question. Have they come up with a new, new formula for alcohol since I was 11 years old? Have they brought out alcohol 2.0? Where it tastes of strawberries and sugar? <laughs> of course not. Alcohol is the discharge of rotting vegetable matter. It's the same now as it was when I was 11. So how did I get a drink problem when I was acutely aware of how disgusting it tasted? Because I persisted. And that's what happens to us. When we first start drinking it, we can't tolerate it. We have to have, you know, we have to have sugary versions, alcopops and shandies and uh, sweet white wine and cider and things like that, because we just can't tolerate the warning sign that our body is giving us that, hey, you're drinking poison. You know, we've, our bodies have evolved over million, millions of years to detect poison. It's a life-saving feature of our evolution. And when you, when you drink alcohol and you go, ah, that's your body responding precisely as it was designed to do, to warn you, hey, you just drank poison, dumbass. Don't do that again. And then, you know, the first time you get drunk and you wake up with your first ever hangover, how bad does that feel? There's your body again going, yeah, yeah, you drank poison again, stupid. This is what it feels like. Don't do it again. And we repeatedly ignore these warning signs. Despite all the logic, despite what our body is screaming at us, we ignore them. And we fit in with the social gang. And eventually, we get used to drinking poison. And then when we've got used to it, the evil clown jumps out and says, aha, I got you. So some people, a lot of people, don't get addicted and can drink in moderation because they never push themselves past that point of no return. They never push themselves so far into the consumption of alcohol that it becomes habitual. It becomes, you know, programmed into their life by their Pavlovian conditioning around the drug. So uh, I hope that helps. Uh, James, if you have any more questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, don't forget, subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you'd like to join me for a free Quit Drinking Without Willpower webinar, go to www.stopdrinkingexpert.com and book your free place right now. Thanks for watching.